And welcome to ETF Edge. It's your go-to place for everything exchange-traded funds. I'm your host, Bob Fazzani, the biggest ETF conference in the world. That's Inside ETF. It starts this Sunday in Hollywood. That's Hollywood, Florida. What's hot and what's not? Let's ask our panelists. Kathleen Smith runs the Renaissance Capital IPO ETF, currently on a tear. Chris Hempstead is the head of ETF Institutional Business Development at New York Life Investments. Todd Rosenbluth. Director of ETF and Mutual Fund Research at CFRA. Todd, I see four hot themes for 2020. The continuation of the fee wars, the race to zero commissions, non-transparent ETFs, thematic ETFs, and ESG. Let's start with the fee wars. We've had a successful race to the bottom. You could buy the S&P 500 right now for three basis points. Does anybody care if we go lower? Is, is, is this sort of the end of the line for the race? the bottom in the field. So unfortunately not, or fortunately for investors, unfortunately not for those of us that cover ETFs and we have to respond to the news. So State Street is actually offering an ETF that tracks a different large cap index, SPLG, and it is converting to use the S&P 500 index this week ahead of the conference. Which means what? So it's gonna ha they're going to have two ETFs that track the S&P 500 index, SPY that charges nine basis right. points for institutional investors, SPLG which charges three basis points that matches VOO. And then you've got well, it's firm. about time. The SPY has been losing assets for years now, primarily because of the nine basis points versus three basis points differential. Right. So iShares has a four basis point ETF, IVV. Vanguard has a three basis point VOO. Yeah. But you're really going to get to see that there's a major difference in ETFs beyond the fees. The performance record outside of these S&P 500 based ETFs right. is much larger, 200, 300, 400 basis points but, but when you look inside. But three basis points is, th what, $3 per 10,000 invest? Right. Does, is anybody going to buy it because it's $2 per 10? My point is the yeah. average investor, Chris, does it matter at this point? Uh, look, I mean, I think investors, we've, we've said this time and time again, you know, look under the hood and do your homework. The, the, the fee is just one part of a multi-part equation. Fee net of performance is what really matters. If you want to, you know, get an ETF that has the strongest performance, sometimes that's going to come with a higher fee. Not everything is a, is a just a broad-based yeah. S&P index fund. Yeah, I think if you could argue that particularly if it's active management, you should charge a higher fee. Nobody should charge three basis points for active management. You if perform. you're doing something unusual, um, you're doing an artificial intelligence choice uh, match, the, then you've got to spend a lot more money. Yeah, I think people need to justify that. Average index stuff, though, we're now in the you know, mid-single digits. I right. think things are settling down. And you're, but what we are going to see is the fees are going to come down for everything else that's not the market cap weighted strategy. So we've seen it in smart beta and thematic. We're going to continue to see it in 2020. Let's move on. Second theme here is non-transparent ETFs. Chris, will investors flock to investors who are switching from actively managed mutual funds over to actively managed ETFs? And as we've said before, just because if you're crummy as an active manager in a mutual fund wrapper, you're still going to be crummy in a... ETF wrapper, you may be more tax efficient. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, I mean, similar, look, the performance has to be there. The manager has to perform. Uh, that was the hottest, you know, announcement of 2019 that these active, non-transparent or semi-transparent ETFs got approval at the SEC. Now, with 2020 being the launch year, what we, much of us, many of us anticipate will be the launch year for non-transparent or semi-transparent. The question is, will the assets come in? Will we see retail and institutional demand that is yet to be seen. We do expect a lot of these funds to come to market with a significant asset base. Now, yeah. but breadth of ownership is what we're going to be looking for. Is everybody buying but, it or just one or two people? I can't help but think it's going to attract some assets. I mean, if and only because people who are following active managers in a mutual fund wrapper will follow them on a lower fee basis in, into mm -hmm. ETFs, it's going to attract some assets. The question is whether any of these guys outperform anymore or whether it makes any difference in a performance basis. R right, and we've got some heavy hitters entering the ETF market or the actively managed ETF market. So Tiro Price, which does not exist in the ETF world, has $170 billion of actively managed mutual fund strategies where there will be an ETF version of that coming in 2020. Fidelity is coming out. American Century is probably going to be the first one that could even happen. Like Mason. Like Mason yeah. is doing it as well. There's a whole, a whole lot of firms that have strong brand names that have a record of outperformance and modest fees for active management that are coming out. If you underperform, you're not going to gather assets. But if you do something different and unique, it, you're going to gather them. Okay, let's move on. Number three theme, thematic ETFs. 2019 was a strong year for thematic ETF yeah. launches. We had video games. We had cloud computing. We had cannabis funds. 
more than we ever imagined coming to market. But the demand was fairly muted on this. Todd, what theme do you think is going to prevail in 2020? What's the pot ETF of of, of 2020. Is there one? Well, I think what's happened in 2019 is when the S&P was up over 30 percent, investors were not looking to find that shiny object, the active, the strategies that are more yeah. narrow in focus. But the ones that did outperform, I think, are likely to see assets continue to climb. So ESPO, which is a video gaming ETF that's out there, outperformed, was up more than 40 percent. That's a Vanek Vectors ETF. BOTZ, which is a, a robotics-oriented ETF from Global X, also outperformed. I think things that worked, investors are going to gravitate towards as they're looking for more narrowly focused strategies. Chris? Yeah, and, and look, the asset growth in these kind of thematic funds, you have to uh, take it with a grain of salt. People aren't going to put 100% of their portfolio into a thematic idea in most cases. Yeah. They're going to take a smaller percentage of their portfolio, take a little bit of risk there, and that's why you won't see hundreds of billions of dollars flowing into a thematic fund. Finally, let's move on to ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Assets in ESG products increased dramatically in 2019. Is the growth going to continue into 2020? I've, I've noted it was a bit of a laughing stock at the start of 2019. No more. All of a sudden, money start flowing into the ESG area. What's going to happen in 2020? We're, we're super excited about ESG at uh, Index IQ. We've launched two products on, with Candrium. They're one of the global leaders in ESG fund management. Um, Look, I mean, there's definitely demand. There's definitely a mandate globally uh, to be more ESG friendly in the investment themes, and that growth is gonna is is gonna continue on. And I think we're already seeing it. In January, we could have a record month. We've already seen two iShares ETFs, ESGE and ESGU, the emerging market and the U.S. version of some of their suite, gather a billion dollars already. We could see a record year as BlackRock and other firms like Index IQ, are more right. committed to this yeah, space than you before. Do, you, you cover IPOs. You look a lot at governance issues, for example, uh, leadership, pay, shareholder rights. Are, are you finding that your, your investors, people who are paying you to do research on these IPOs, are asking more about governance? This is an ESG issue. Uh, governance is a really a long-term issue. It's really hard to bake that into stock prices in the more immediate future. So when we do research, we're saying, is this governance going to help when earnings come out? When is it going to be a rocky road? It, it's a longer term uh, issue. So if you're overall looking at a stock, that'll be a part of it, but it won't be the overriding factor.